So we're going to take a look at art during and after the World Wars, and it does really begin in World War I as you're seeing the fighting of the trenches and you're watching uh, your friends and comrades march over the top um, to walk to run across no man's land and seeing friend after friend die. And those that were survivors come back with not only physical diseases like the trench foot and um, the burning from gas. And uh, they also come back with psychological diseases, including PTSD, which they're calling shell shock, um, and just an overall questioning of the purpose of life and the meaning of life. And that's what we're going to look at kind of coming through in art in this period. So uh, they've watched, if you remember back towards the 1800s was a time of positivism, you have Darwin saying that through science, we can figure out the origins of man, you have a um, thrust at understanding science and understanding the world in which we live. And, and people are feeling positive that if we can reform society using these scientific methods, the bad parts of society will go away. And there was a sentiment, not in everyone, but a sentiment about the World War, that this was the Great War. This is the war to end all wars. Once we do this using our advanced technology, we'll prove once and for all who's the best and, and just move on with life. And we won't have to have war again. So that positive uh, approach towards life was seen, um, even as they're marching to the trenches. Of course, that is then matched with a truly devastating knowledge of what technology can do. So here they're, they're positive about the goodness of man and, and the perfectibility of man. And then they watch man's inventions tear up bodies and um, mow down troops. And the, this, this causes a sense of disillusionment. So um, AP talks about this in Key Concept 4.3, um, and they basically focus on the, the undermined confidence in human science and reason. And we see it starting in World War I. The economic depression, again, undermines that because here's something, a man-made institution in the economy, things that men thought they could mark and, and figure out how to work and, and now it's not even working and uh, they start to just wonder well how do we know what we know and how do we know if anything really exists accurately so uh, this leads to a movement within art which is known as the lost generation and, and I suspect you've heard about that in some of your English classes but the lost generation are these survivors that have been through the trenches and are coming back now to a world that looks very very different that looks that is missing many of their friends and comrades. There's some survivor's guilt, of course, and uh, that's that's going to define some of the writings in particular of the period. The first book that kind of should come to mind as we think about the lost generation is Remarque's All Quiet on the Western Front. It was written originally in French, and it is about a German soldier. So here's a French author writing about a German, and he writes it in a very sympathetic way towards this German. The French are the enemy in the book, and the point is the pointlessness of war. This is actually turned into a movie before World War II. So this book and movie will have a significant effect upon the psyche and the understanding of war, and also helps us understand some of the reticence leading into World War II of some of the great powers to even enter the war at all. Franz Kafka, hopefully you've read, uh, he's also known for Metamorphos, but the trial demonstrate some of this kind of just questioning, can we know anything? And it's a whole book, it's not long, but it's a whole book about guilt without knowledge. This guy is accused of something, he's arrested in the first couple of chapters, and um, he doesn't, he goes through the whole book trying to figure out why he was arrested, what he's on trial for, and he never finds out. There's also an underlying critique of totalitarianism, to kind of keep that in mind. And then um, James Joyce, writes Ulysses, which is, of course, based on the Odyssey, but is a more stream of consciousness method of telling the story, which is fascinating because here he is taking a loved and uh, tried and true novel that, or sorry, epic poem from as far back as we can remember, and he's retelling it and even questioning it in the way that he's retelling. So we're starting to see the stream of consciousness again, just, well, what's in my brain? It's not about logical order. It's not about us having um, an established tradition. It's about me questioning and almost revising that tradition. Virginia Woolf is a little bit different. She's a woman 
author and she writes a woman of a room of our own which is about the woman's perspective and independence in this new world it's less a stream of consciousness let it's more of a challenge to the ideals and social ideals of the period so those are some authors um and then you start to see a movement within art and that movement is going to be dem uh, very much uh influenced by this guy sigmund freud we've already talked about him we wanted to just kind of underscore him, and apparently my video is covering up half of the words. That's annoying. Well, Key Concept 4.3 also talks about how new movements within art and architecture uh, actually question these Western society values and question our own knowledge of ourselves. And a lot of that is coming from this guy, Sigmund Freud, who argues, and you've seen this before, who argues that most of our consciousness is actually like an iceberg. What we know about ourselves is a very small percentage of who we actually are, even just in what's going on in our mind. So he's not even talking about necessarily physical things, but how we psychologically evaluate ourselves is very much unknown actually to ourselves. And you have this concept of the ego, which is the pe person that we know and we present to the world, the id, which is totally underlying. We don't even know it's there, but it's our instincts, it's our animal almost sense. And then the super ego, which is very much implanted there from external forces, he believes, um, but still conscious because that's like our conscience. That's telling us what is right and wrong, what we shouldn't do. Uh, and so that is um, kind of who makes us up. And if most of it isn't known, then the artists are going to try to tap into that unknown part of themselves. And that comes through in four different movements. And I'm going to walk through them pretty quickly. You can also find these AP Euro students on your um, World War I working document. All right, you've got four movements. You've got Cubism, Futurism, Dadism, Surrealism. Cubism, uh, come, we've already talked about this. Again, all four of these are modernism. Cubism is invented by Picasso. It's very much about distinct boxes uh, for different perspectives. It starts in Spain and moves to France. Uh, futurism is a it's primarily Italian movement. It celebrates the technological change. It's uh, a focus on moving past the libraries and the past traditions. That's why they have this concept of burn the libraries, demolish the cities. Uh, it's it's anti the standard aesthetic and western values but what's really interesting is it's not fully liberal it's not uh pro-feminism it's not pro-film it is a um almost traditionalist nationalist italian movement and um different therefore from dadism even though you're going to see some similarities between all these artworks dadism starts during world war one it is less about um, the actual art as we would think in paintings. It's more art, theater, or sculpture. And it just protests society. It's, the purpose of it is to offend French sensibilities. And uh, they do a good job because they put absurd things together. They just combine different pieces, uh, whether that's in art or in um, visual arts. And people were truly offended. And that was the point they were trying to get across. Dadism technically goes along with nihilism. It's just about nothing. Surrealism. Now, the surreal means that you're in a dream. So it's surreal and realistic. It's kind of all about that dream state. And it is very clearly following after the ideas of Sigmund Freud. It's realistic, but then it combines things that you wouldn't expect to see. Um, and it is often in paintings. So let's take a look at a couple examples. Here's cubism. You can see the broken up squares and shapes as they look at these are three musicians playing. And there you go. Here is futurism. Notice how you're almost moving into the future. There's so much motion. There is so much uh, push towards the future, uh, celebration of some of the new technologies, but at the same time, these kind of falling down cities. So what is, what is this artwork saying? What is it saying about what will the future be? All right, here's surrealism. Apparently this is not in order. Surrealism, this is a very famous painting. It's actually very small. I've seen it in person. It's about this big. And it's uh, by Salvador Dali, a famous name in surrealism. And it's called, um, well, you see the melting clocks there. And it's, again, realistic and yet a strange combination. What is that thing in the middle? Um, why are these clocks melting? You almost see an influence of Einstein with the relativity of time. So there's, it's, it's dreamlike. Things you expect to see and then don't expect to see. And then lastly, here's Dadism. And, and again, just take a look at it. It's an absurd combination. You have a ruler and a head and it's got, um, you know, bells and whistles and a very different aspect of that. 
And then lastly, this does go into architecture and with the Bauhaus movement of the 30s, which is all about efficiency, combining different materials, but unifying the purpose of the materials, the metal, etc., with um, the purpose that you're trying to present. And that is the modernism of world wars. <laughs>